Pete, you mentioned um, account restrictions and it's something that a lot of people get really annoyed about because you don't have to be a big winning punter or even a big punter now to have trouble getting on. How do you think that should be sorted out? Do you think we could ever make the bookmakers, you know, change their ways? I mean, I could be wrong. I, I, I do believe that the only sport where you can't get, a, well, you can get a big bet on, but if you win, you, you get barred. It's, it's horse racing. So what, what are we saying? Are we saying that the, are we saying that the sport is too, too, too open to people suspectedly in the know? Are we saying talking about harbing? Are we talking about? People nicking a price. We're talking about traders. A particular uh, business is not being strong enough in terms of marketing up. To me, if a company is going to put up a price <coughs> the night before, they should be willing to take a, a small enough bet on it. Now, I've learned, unfortunately, over the last few years, that you have to have your bet small. Um, I mean, I'd love to go in and put a hundred pound each way on some of the winners that I've had recently. But you, if I did that, I knew I know that I'd be barred. I mean, it's quite surprising actually that a recent I, I did publicise on Twitter a company after one win, a thirty-three to one was backed into eighteen to one, it suspended my account or restricted my account. So what are we saying? Are we saying horse racing is is bent? Are we saying horse racing is a sport that you can't have a good money back I, I, th I, th I think it's more down to the fact that nowadays the focus for these big corporations big companies horse racing has gone down the league table compared to what it was years ago it's probably number one number two sport in the 20 30 years ago now it's you've got football you've got NFL you've got golf you've got cricket you've got anything you can bet on I think horse racing requires a stronger skill set to be able to, to, to back winners. And the odds are quite often not, not quite right. And I had a big argument about value, but to me, value is all about winning. If you get the value and you've won, that's, to me, that's value. But if you've got the value and it loses, you've, you've lost. So. <laughs> As a bookie I know, used to say, you can eat value. No, you can't. Now, you mentioned it's, uh, it's not easy. You're a successful punter these days, and you've got a lot of followers on Twitter because you give your bets away for free. Why on earth do you do that? I always thought to myself, well, if you, if you make money from tipping up horse racing, then why do you need to charge for it? Why, why, why would I put up a... When I'm working, I mean, if, if situations change, obviously, and I'm, I find myself not working in three or four months' time or six months' time, then there might be a need to, to charge for it. But if I'm working and I'm making, making an extra living from betting, I don't see the need to charge for that. And I look at it as a game of cat and mouse. I, it, it's always punter versus the bookmaker. And what, what's not been addressed, and you have <clears throat> this, with so many tips that are put up, you see these links, to other, other bookmakers and you think you, you, you don't get into bed with them there should be someone out there and hopefully we can do that is have someone against the bookmakers it's not it's not it's not in a in a in a nasty way it's in a in a this is cat and mouse industry bookmakers make millions there have been cases where they've mergers for billions we've been too much or certainly a, a number of people have been too much in bed with bookmakers to actually affiliate with them. And, and to my detriment, actually, with Bet Race, going back to Bet Racing Nation, probably because we didn't have the affiliates strong. But that's probably why I had to go, because we weren't making loads of money. We had one or two sponsors, and I would like to thank Bedford, Bedford for sponsoring us at the time, because they were the only ones that, the only big events, but they were the ones willing to do that. What you've got now is a situation where there is definitely a marketplace for people to work against the bookmaker not for them and what I mean by that is you know if you see we will have more restricted um, accounts no doubt but if you see odds the more people that are trying to get those on for the benefit of themselves as opposed to the benefit of the bookmakers I think benefit everyone and you don't want to see people putting up race after race there's seven race cards you don't want to see tips every day for each race because that way you just can't make the money Okay, you mentioned before um, you see things every day that should be maybe looked into. Um, what's your opinion on, for example, all weather racing as opposed to 
jumping all flat? Is there one code that you think is straighter than another? That's a good question. I, I, I mean, as an enthusiast, I prefer the jump racing. Um, I've seen a lot of things go on in the all weather um, over the winter that I, I think when you when you've watched the, people say, oh, you're not a jockey or whatever. I've seen I've, I'm able to be quite a good judge, and I've seen thousands and thousands of races. And when a jockey doesn't want to win on an all weather and a horse that is handicapped for the future, they will not win. I'm not going to name names. But there are definitely a few out there that are on sort of top of my five list that if, and you learn every day at this game, you know, you might notice something, you think, well, I'm not going to back that again if it's an outsider and uh, it should be shorter. But you just, you do pencil these in and you do see certain jockeys that will, will, will endeavour to try their best when the money's down and, and not so much when there's a big drift. Do I take notice of exchanges? It's difficult not to. But I think the more competitive the race, I think you, you shouldn't take too much notice of it. If you've got a four-runner race and you've got an odds-on shot the night before that suddenly drifts, then I think you should take notice of it. But in competitive racing, I, I don't take too much notice of that. If you've got a 15-runner race and the horse has drifted, I think it's even better because, you know, you might even put more on. I mean, uh, and vice versa. I mean, people following me would realise that I did a... Uh, an all-weather horse actually trained by Carl Burke that, that was 33 to 1 in the morning. Now, the night before, I didn't actually put it up, but I did put it down. Uh, I, I did have a bet on it, 14 to 1. The next morning, I look, it's 33s. So I went in again, and I think that's the part of trying to guess the prices, trying to see where it is. That 33 to 1 became 8 to 1 before the off, and it won. And it always, it's not always going to happen like that. But sometimes you shouldn't let a horse that drifts in the market put you off your original instinct of, of backing that particular horse. When well, you say you don't take any notice, I try not to take notice of the exchanges. What about these people? You put your, you put your uh, bets up on Twitter. Mm. Sometimes they win, more often than not they win. Sometimes they lose, and when they lose, out come the trolls from under their bridge. Yeah. How, what, how do you cope with those sort of people? I mean, what do you think about the, the nature of Twitter, etc. These days, I, 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 I laugh it off. To be honest with you, I think it's quite funny that people can troll. The good thing is that I, I, I might be wrong, but I think I'm the only one that. Well, there are a couple of other people actually, but the, you know, put, put their bets up beforehand. You can't go around putting up after and go, "Well, I've had this 33 to one. You're shot. You should have been part of it." So they're all there for to see. I mean, we've done the October challenge whereby we had a, a, a started off with a thousand made 600 odd pounds then uh, november the first 15 no, days of november anyone following the selections that i put up the first 15 days it was a little bit like oh do i keep doing this because i was down quite a bit on the first 15 days of november and i didn't have that many people actually troll me out to be honest with you but it, um i have done since the new year and after sort of a, a, a few losers this week but over the period of time, people have got to understand, when they're betting, it's not what happens on the day, and it may not be what happens over two weeks. We set a 50-day uh, challenge. The first 15 days, that was down. After day 45, 46, it was over 2,000 pound up. By the end of it, it was, it was about 1,700, I think, up. So it's, it's how you bet and not react to that day so what I mean by that is you day one you bet you lose 50 quid but some people will think oh I've got to I've got to double my money or I've got to have another bet on the last race just to get my money back that's the worst thing you can do there's always always tomorrow 